On this Epiphany Sunday, Western Christians traditionally celebrate the journey of the three wise men and their worship of Jesus. After all, this is the first time in history that Gentiles will bow down before Christ, something that won't happen again for another 50 years or so when the Apostle Paul starts converting pagans all across the Roman Empire. This is supposed to be their epiphany, their realization that Christ is the Savior, the Savior of all humankind. We often assume that these men from the East were converted to Christianity that night. After all, they traveled an awfully long way just to see someone else's God. But what if they crossed a thousand miles of burning sands just to pay their respects? I think that would perhaps be an even nobler gesture, a selfless journey. But I wonder, how far are we willing to go to understand those who don't share our beliefs? From the second chapter of Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then they opened their treasure chests. They offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. The community of Derby is a small town like so many others in the fine state of Connecticut. A blue-collar, post-industrial manufacturing center whose factories have all long since closed their doors. But nestled within the tall, ancient trees and abandoned warehouses, there stands a state-of-the-art medical facility. Griffin Hospital was established as a sort of experiments in the evolution of health care, a holistic approach to medicine that cares for body, mind, and soul. The hallways of the Griffin facility are all carpeted and aglow with a warm, ambient light. Soothing music can be heard echoing throughout, and the whole place feels more like a day spa than a typical hospital. Not that I've ever been to a day spa. They even hired a practicing Buddhist as their senior chaplain. But that might not have been the best idea, given that about 35% of Derby's residents are Roman Catholic, and only 0.08% identify with an Eastern religion. The Buddhist name was Tom, 
And you might say that his ministry at Griffin Hospital was doomed from the beginning. Chaplaincy is hard work to begin with. Days filled with visits to people of varying faiths or none at all. People who will throw you out of their room if you're not a priest or if you are a priest, depending on their religious baggage. So you can imagine how much trouble a disciple of the Buddha would have had in a predominantly Catholic neighborhood. Many of the hospital's patients wouldn't give Tom the time of day, and the hospital's staff wasn't much better. For a time, I worked at Griffin as part of my training for the ministry, and that's where I met Tom. Tom stumbled into the office one morning in a bleary-eyed stupor. He told me that he'd thrown out his back the night before and that he was completely doped up on some pretty serious pain medication. The night before, Tom had arrived right here at this very hospital in an ambulance. And while the doctors were treating him in the emergency room, they asked him if he'd like a visit from the chaplain. (laughs) I am the chaplain, he tried to tell them through gritted teeth. And then he heard one of them say, this guy's delirious. We'd better sedate him. For a number of years, Griffin Hospital has been on CNN's list of the top 100 places to work in America. And for most people, it probably is. It's a nice place. But not for poor old Tom. That night, he realized that what Jesus said was all too true, and that it applied to Buddhists as well. That a prophet is not without honor, except in his own house. Tom fortunately moved on from Griffin after only about a year uh, to a facility called Devil's Rock, which some people might think is a fitting place for a Buddhist. But in spite of their being different from uh, from a different religious tradition, the wise men from the East received a much warmer welcome at the manger of the Christ child. It certainly doesn't hurt that they bow down at the feet of Christ. Surely if Tom the chaplain had done as much, he'd have had an easier time of things. And yet, this is not a story of conversion. These wise men don't convert to Christianity, which didn't even exist yet. And they didn't convert to Judaism either. They pay their respects, and they go home. Perhaps this story is better understood as a beautiful experience of interfaith dialogue than as a conversion story. Now, there's a lot of debate about this, and no one knows for certain, but the so-called wise men from the East were probably Zoroastrian priests from the Parthian Empire in Persia. Let's just call that an educated guess, based on the fact that Matthew refers to them as magi in the original Greek text, a term derived from the Persian magus, which was used in the ancient world in reference specifically to adherents of Zoroastrianism, which was the religion of ancient Persia. Now, the Persians and the Israelites back then had a history together. About 600 years before the birth of Christ and the arrival of the wise men at the manger, the Jewish-Israelite kingdom fell to the might of the Babylonian Empire, which was steadily expanding across the region. The Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, burned the temple to the ground, and enslaved or exiled most of the Jews from the city, casting them out of the Holy Land that their God had once promised them. Just a few decades later, the Persians arrive on the scene, led by the magnificent King Cyrus II, also known as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus defeated the, Persian, uh, the Babylonians and recaptured Jerusalem, essentially liberating the city from its military occupation. Now, Cyrus was known for his relatively benevolent approach to imperial expansion, which is to say that he allowed his subjects a certain degree of religious freedom and independence. So he invited the Jewish exiles to come back home 
Naturally, they hailed the Persians as saviors. In the Bible, the prophet Isaiah even calls Cyrus the Lord's anointed one, the Messiah. Of course, the Persians had a Messiah of their own. In the ancient world, religions were a lot more permeable than they are today. Various cultures that lived close to one another would often exchange religious ideas, even adopting aspects of their neighbor's theology into their own religion. And it's not certain whether the Persians or the Israelites first came up with this idea of a Messiah, but what we do know is that it's an idea they both shared, which is probably what brought those Zoroastrian priests across the desert to witness his birth. So needless to say, the Jewish people and the Persians were on rather good terms for a very long time. And it's no surprise that Mary and Joseph gave them a warm welcome by virtue of their heritage. Unfortunately, these good relations couldn't last forever. Fast forwarding to the 7th century, after the birth of Christ, Persia was conquered by Muslim Arabs, who by virtue of their Abrahamic faith, laid their own claim to the Holy Land. And once the Jews and the Muslims started fighting over that piece of land, their friendship with Persia was effectively over. Today, what was once ancient Persia is known by another name, Iran. And it's no secret that Israel and Iran don't really get along. This little history lesson begs an important question, I think. Why is it that some religious traditions are friendly towards one another, whereas others are openly hostile? As a denomination, our own United Church of Christ really prides itself on its religious tolerance and its progressive approach to interfaith dialogue. Unlike some branches of Christianity, we don't claim to have a monopoly on the truth. We're willing and we're even eager to acknowledge that there are many different paths to God and that there's real beauty to be found in the rich tapestry of faith that covers the earth. Contrary to popular belief, we in the United Church of Christ believe in Christ. And we believe that Jesus was the manifestation of God. But we also recognize that many people experience God in other ways. There's a well-known Buddhist parable that illustrates this, a tale of three blind monks, each of whom is trying to describe an elephant to the other two. The first monk runs his hand along the trunk, and he decides that uh, the elephant is like a tree branch. And the second monk runs his hand along the elephant's leg, and tells the others that it's like a stone pillar. And the third grasps the elephant's tail and insists that it feels like a rope. Before long, all three of these blind men begin to quarrel with one another, each of them convinced that their description of the elephant is the correct one. In the United Church of Christ, we recognize what they fail to see, that each one of these men has experienced the truth, but only a fraction of it. Well, this lesson is easily applied to the world's major religions, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, and so on and so forth. But does our respect for other religions extend to every faith? What about Scientologists? What about the Church of Satan? Yes, there really is a Church of Satan that enjoys tax-exempt status from the IRS. What about them? Do they deserve our respect as a legitimate religious tradition? Well, in that particular case, I would argue that they don't. And not because I disagree with their beliefs, and not because I agree with them either, but because they don't really believe in anything, least of all the devil. They don't have any beliefs. They're just a sort of gothic, hedonistic social club that celebrates the individual's freedom to do as they please. The devil is just a a symbol of their, their rebellious nature. It's a philosophy, 
not a religion. They do engage in ritual practices, but only as a sort of mockery of Christian worship. So in other words, adherents of the Church of Satan aren't really as evil as you might think they'd be. They're just really obnoxious. (laughs) It seems to me that if you're going to call yourself a church or a religion, you actually have to believe in something. I'm sure there are plenty of things that religious people don't believe in or recognize as legitimate. Protestants don't recognize the authority of the Pope. Jews don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Muslims don't recognize Jews as the chosen people. And Mormons don't recognize each other at the liquor store. (laughs) But they do recognize God. They recognize a higher power, and they worship something that extends beyond the individual self. That, I think, is what makes a religious tradition legitimate and sincere. Now, there are a lot of Christians out there who aren't so broad in their definition of faith. They think that if you don't have faith in Jesus, that if you're Jewish or Muslim or even the wrong kind of Christian, if you're gay or lesbian or transgendered, if you're pro-choice or atheist, then you're doomed to an eternity in the fires of hell. Some traditions don't even recognize Catholics as being Christian, which somewhat baffles me. I mean, I don't always agree with everything the Catholic Church says, but let's face it, they were here first. (laughs) And these other Christians, they probably don't think much of us either. But to be fair, what do we think of them? Do we recognize the legitimacy of their faith? In all honesty, I really struggle with that question. I'd rather not even ask it, because it's not easy to answer without offending people at both ends of the theological spectrum. So I ask for your patience while I give it a try. Someone from this congregation recently said something to me that I haven't been able to get out of my head. He said, you know, I've noticed that this church is really welcoming to all people. But then he added, unless you're a conservative Christian. I have to admit that he wasn't wrong. And as one of your pastors, I've certainly never shied away from poking fun at the religious right. Especially when it comes to their views on creation, homosexuality, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, heaven, hell, prayer, worship styles, clerical vestments, taste in music, and the price of coffee in Brazil. And when it comes to defending people of different faith or or traditions or sexual orientations from those who would condemn them, I have no regrets about speaking my mind. I've gone after that wily old preacher, Pat Robertson, a number of times, and I don't expect that I'm about to stop now. But if I'm being honest with myself, I have to admit that I've been a little mean-spirited at times. The truth is, I'm harder on other Christians than I am on anyone else. I mean, it's not like radical Muslims or Hasidic Jews are especially friendly to the gay and lesbian community. But you've never heard me criticize them for it. I just get frustrated when I hear other Christians describing Jesus, my Jesus, as a man that I don't recognize. Things get complicated when we feel like our God has been co-opted, hijacked. And that's exactly what happens, I think, when two different groups of people with different beliefs try to live on the same piece of ground. Just like Israeli Jews and Palestinian Muslims fighting over that holy land that they're both trying to occupy. Different varieties of Christians have tried to stake their claim in Christ, to convert him to our own particular brand of Christianity. As though his being Jewish somehow weren't good enough. Christians aren't like those blind monks laying their hands on different parts of the elephant. No. We're all grasping at the tail arguing about what it feels like, knocking one another over to try and get a better grip. 
And the elephant isn't enjoying it at all. So I have something of a confession to make. I've been taking my son to another church. Well, not a church exactly, more of a church-sponsored program. You see, there's this place down the street from where I live called the Trinity Kids Zone. It's not really a church. It's more like a big indoor playground for little kids. Now, we're always looking for places to take little Ethan where he can run around without breaking anything. So I stopped in one day to have a look around and see what this place was all about. And I have to say, it's pretty incredible. It's big, it's clean. Best of all, it's free. A very nice woman gave me a tour of the place, and oddly enough, she never said a single word about Jesus. I mean, the place was obviously a thinly veiled front for an evangelical agenda, but she didn't even invite me to attend any worship services. Just showed me around and told me that I was welcome to come back any time with my son, provided that I register at the front desk with my personal information. Ah, I thought to myself, there's the rub. Once they've got my number, they won't leave me alone. I'll be bombarded with phone calls and pamphlets in the mail. Still, it was a nice place. The playground also has a coffee shop for parents, so I decided to buy a cup and sit down and look this place up on my phone to see if I could learn what was really going on here. Turns out the Kid Zone is a sort of satellite location for a local Missouri Synod Lutheran church. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Missouri Synod Lutherans are the ultra-conservative branch of Lutheranism. They don't even ordain women. I was clearly at moral and ideological odds with these people, and I started to feel guilty for even drinking their coffee, even though it tasted pretty good. Thus far, my experience of the place had been nothing but positive. Great ambiance, friendly people, good coffee and a clean and safe environment for my son to play in. But my instincts were rebelling. My open-minded, theologically progressive prejudice was telling me that these people were up to something. Still, free entertainment for your toddler is not easy to come by. So I registered at the front desk, and I've been bringing him back from time to time ever since. The things we do for our children. Well, it's been almost a year now of waiting for the other shoe to drop, but I haven't received a single phone call or postcard in the mail. Not that I would have faulted them for it. I mean, that's what I would have done in their position. But they've made no attempt to invite me to church, to bring me to Jesus, or to save my wretched soul. At first, I thought this whole establishment was just a clever means of bringing people into their church, but that doesn't really seem to be the case at all. And when that theory didn't pan out, I figured it was a way to bring in income by a coffee shop. Until I saw a poster on the wall that says that 100% of the proceeds are donated to charity. When all's said and done, I can only conclude that there are no ulterior motives at work here. That this place is a ministry of outreach to families like mine, to people like me. I have no doubt that if I went to their church on Sunday morning, I'd hear more than a few things that I don't agree with. But as I watch my son playing with their little Noah's Ark toys, making animal sounds as he picks up the cows and the horses, I'm reminded that he doesn't care about their theology. And he doesn't care about mine either. If only we could all be so innocent. If only we could all find some common ground instead of focusing only on what divides us. Maybe that common ground is right here, at the communion table, where Christ is real and present, and where we can put aside our differences and love one another as children of the same God, where we can receive one another's gifts with open hearts and open hands, just as Jesus received treasures from those priests of an altogether different faith on that holy night. On that night, no one was converted, but everyone was changed. Amen.